Okay, uh, my name is Paul. I'm from Arcusic Loudspeakers. Uh, we're a specialist Danish speaker brand. Um, I run the UK side of things here and uh, um, I'm loving every minute of it. So my love of sound, I think, came about, there was a, there was a moment when I went to a friend's house um, as a teenager. So it was, uh, I was probably 14, 15, something like that. I went to a friend's house um, after a game of tennis and um, we went to go and put some music on on his dad's hi-fi and his dad had a really good hi-fi system. And um, well, this will age it, it was Money For Nothing, Dire Straits, a Brothers In Arms album. And I remember sitting there thinking, I have never heard anything like this. And I wanted to hear more of it. I just thought it sounded incredible. My dad always had a good hi-fi system, but not as good as that. And that was, that was stunning. And I didn't, I didn't think too much of it. I don't think I thought of it consciously. I didn't think this is something for me, but there was some, a spark that was, that was sort of set off then. And then having followed up with a, um, a career at a very well-respected hi-fi store, that was at the beginning of, um, of surround sound. So laser discs and playing films like uh, Speed and Twister and um, Mission Impossible, the first Mission Impossible film, playing those to clients and thinking, this is incredible. It sounded amazing just in Pro Logic. And it was then finding films that I genuinely loved, you know, not, not Twister, but finding films like Blade Runner and Apocalypse Now and realizing that they were stunning and sort of going back retrospectively and realizing how much was in these films that I thought I already loved and then ended up loving even more and seeing more depth into all these films. So that was kind of the spark that I haven't looked back since really. Audio is, is one of the tools the directors and filmmakers use. So they, they, can, they can use sound to manipulate us in the nicest, nicest ways to, to sort of pull on emotions of the part of the story that they're telling. So there's so much that goes on, I think, in a subconscious level with the audio of a, of a, of a, of a movie, which is not necessarily as obvious or as, um, as clear as the picture is used. The picture tells us what's happening, but I think the sound tells us where, and I think the, t the sound tells us in what context and how. And it's done on a much more subconscious level, so it's, it's not showy, or often isn't showy. It's used subtly and, um, and with a lot of, of, of intent and very deliberately, but it's the sort of thing that because it's, it's, if, it's, if it's well done, it's very rarely noticed. It's a, it's a much more subtle medium, and, and I, I love it for that. I think the, the subtlety that can be used to transport you to a place um, and, and make you feel a certain way. There's, there's things like, um, um, there's a film called Room, which, which I'm a big fan of, which uses sound in a fantastic way, where there's, um, so the first 45 minutes or so is very oppressive sound, and you feel quite trapped as the client, as the customer, uh, as the uh, as the protagonists do, so it's um, it, it's making you feel a lot of empathy with them. You feel what they're feeling, and as they get into a different environment, the sound changes, and again you, you feel that with them. It's it's subtle changes, and there's so many films use it in certain ways. A Quiet Place does it brilliantly, where the sound is probably more important than the picture. P perhaps fairly obviously in that example, but there's a lot of subtlety used in that that um, that I think transports it to a into a, a work of art really and and some of the sound design in um in, in small little films like um pie is a favorite of mine i think you sound really inventively not the sort of thing you necessarily necessarily demonstrate but are so much part of the character of the film or the the empathy that we're feeling with certain characters or or, or different ways to to make us feel within within that space so yeah sounds sounds incredibly powerful and when used properly is something that's rarely noticed but it's noticed when it's wrong uh, we always approach a cinema room uh, holistically, so picture and sound. Cinema is both picture and sound, and both are of equal importance in terms of the overall experience. I think every every room is is treated with the same um, the same approach from us, where we would um, look at the space. It's all about the room itself rather than the kit that's going in it. So the room dictates to us how to design it. So it starts with the room, the size of the room, the seating positions, um, door positions, window positions, all of the things that are um, immovable or, or difficult to move, and then working the right system for that space. And Dolby and the industry thankfully give us all the rules and all the, um, the templates to, to design to. So I think it's our job really to take what they've given us, what they've told us in terms of loudspeaker positions, in terms of dynamic range that's required, screen sizes that are correct for the, for the, for the viewing position, and taking those elements to make sure that the, 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 the pillars of the, 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 the building blocks of the cinema, the, the, the foundations of it are right. 
because from there you can then go into you know making it you know, fine tuning everything but we've got to get those foundations right first so making sure that we've got the right number of speakers in the right position for the right speaker location with the right size screen the right brightness that gets us so far to making an amazing experience and um, that's the thing we concentrate on first and foremost um, and uh, and helping helping to design rooms the right way there is rarely an ideal room size because even ideal rooms have doors in them so there's always something that gets in the way of making it making it right um, there are obviously some rooms that are easier to work with than others and but i don't we very rarely come across a room that can't be done there's just you just need to make perhaps um some some intelligent compromises in certain rooms but all, all rooms can end up with something fun there are better rooms than others naturally I think the the standard rooms that we see coming up time and time again that work very well are five by four meters, six by four meters, six by five, seven by five, that kind of size. We don't really want a square room if we can help it, but if we have got a square room, we can make it work. Um, and we use um, simulation software to make sure that we're challenging or, or, or taking into account the challenges of the room at the design stage rather than at the too late stage. So making sure that at the at before anything's gone any further than just the design and, and, uh, and, and emails, it's making sure that the room is working as best it can by having maybe moving the seating position or maybe moving the speaker positions, probably subwoofer positions, that's the main thing. Making sure that the subwoofers are the right number in the right location. Um, and then obviously taking into account that although we might have what looks great on a, a simulated curve, is it also practical? Is it aesthetically acceptable is it financially acceptable all these things come into part of that equation as well but doing it at the design stage i think can mean that we can address nearly all of the the significant problems very very early on yeah the beauty of cinema design is that because there are fixed standards the the size of the screen is based on an angle so that angle is always consistent whether we're close to it or further back we just have a smaller or a larger screen so the actual um end experience is a very similar one it's a predictable experience we know that that we're going to end up with something that is um, is almost the same in any room because we're basing it on the same criteria and it's the same thing with the dynamic range and the speaker locations um, the the dynamic range is is much harder to achieve in a large room as it is in a small room but if we achieve it then it's the same experience so of course there are subtle differences between large rooms and small rooms sometimes a large room can feel more spacious and it can have more of a an epic feel about it and the small rooms can feel a bit more intimate a bit more detailed but ultimately they're not better or worse for it they end up with a very predictable experience and i think i think that's important that when we're designing rooms we don't have we're not guessing at it we, we know that we've got some standards to work to so that we've got some some confidence in the predictable nature of these rooms which means that we can guarantee a performance every time making sure that you know every system we that we we design and calibrate is uh, as good as it can possibly be uh, too many there's too <laughs> too too many to choose um and too many that i love i think there's dynamic range is is uh, something that is used very very cleverly by some very good filmmakers and uh, some examples of ones that are fantastic there's a the opening of 10 cloverfield lane has some fantastic sound design in it and is a favorite of ours it is incredibly challenging to uh, to to produce with the the dynamics that it that it needs but it's a lot of fun when you do so it starts off with a a musical score and clearly something not quite going right in her life as she she goes on a road trip and the musical score is is all we hear we don't really hear the real world at all until the scene changes and we see her feeling a little bit uneasy with the situation and then the real world comes into that and we start to feel a little bit of apprehension with her and then the dynamics happen so no spoilers which is just intense and incredible um, but from that moment then we get transported to another location and the sound tells us where we are not the picture the picture shows her in a room the sound tells us that she's underground and for all we know she could be in a studio in Shepparton but it feels like she's underground and something threatening is happening and it's not it's not terrifying but it's got that kind of that gripping nature where the sound is doing all the work for us here to say pay attention something's happening and that that's a fantastic one um ad astra's got it right at the beginning i think the opening of first man's incredible as well there's loads of a greater showman's got it there's the dynamic range in a lot of uh, a lot of these um these soundtracks bohemian rhapsody is fantastic um so yeah, there's plenty, plenty. And I think once you hear it and you realize why that dynamic range is so important, we talk about high dynamic range in audio all the time. 
high dynamic range in video all the time. Um, it's something that HDR has become accepted and has been, um, has, has been acknowledged as being important for picture quality. I think it's just as important in sound. High dynamic range in sound is, is part of the experience. To have the, the whisper quiets through to the, the huge explosions and, the, um, and, and everything in between. In, in First Man, there's the, the aircraft that he's up in is rattling apart as it tests the laws of, of physics. And at the same time, you can hear his leather gloves creaking as he writes down the, the, the notes that he's making. The, the difference between those details, uh, A Monster Calls has also got this with a beautiful pencil that's, that's scratching the paper and then a big tree monster that is tree monster sound. You know, it's got that, that dynamic between the two is, is, is part of that journey that's taking us with it. It happens in music as well. That snare drum, that kick drum, that's, that's where the fun's at. The trumpet in Art Blakey, you know, it's those, those things that, that gives us the dynamics and the energy in, in music and films. There's a, there's a lot of elements in the cinema design that are all of, of varying degrees of importance, probably all equally important to be fair. Um, and this is, I think what we try to approach is let's get the stuff that is, n that is not subjective. Let's get the things that are, that are factual, that are engineering, that are mathematical, that we can prove are right, that we can justify as being a correct choice for a, for a justifiable reason. And then we can get into the, um, the subjective stuff of, of whether we like it or whether we prefer it, which is all, all, all valid. And um, in terms of getting the speaker locations, I think that, that's told to us by Dolby. They have templates for this. They give us the angles. They tell us the right angles for the speakers based on our viewing position. comes right back to the seating position, as always. Um, let's get the, the speakers in the right location. If, they, if they're in the right location, that is a... a we can't get it right if they're in the wrong place. You know, they have to be in the right place. It's no different to a stereo system and having the speakers too close together or too far apart. You have to start with the speakers in the correct location. And Dolby are fairly forgiving. You know, if there is a door there, there, are, there is a, a shaded area where they can move to, which is, is forgiving. It's not, it's, it's not completely um, um, scripted. You know, we, we can improvise from it, but there's guidelines to make sure that we have the speakers in the right locations. And from there, we then need to make sure that those speakers are dynamic enough. And, um, very easy calculations between the power and the sensitivity relationship and the ultimate um, power output, of, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, output of a speaker in terms of its volume output, sound pressure level. That's that combination of that, 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 um, that sum that we're going to, that, that equation that we do will tell us whether the speaker is able to do it. And depending on the distance, we'll have some models that can and we'll have some models that can't. And our job here really is to advise, well, this is the speaker we should start with. This one is the one that will deliver the 105 dB and the dynamic range that are on, is, is available for the soundtracks. Let's start with that one if we can. If we can't, then let's make an intelligent compromise, but let's try not to. Let's try to make it right. So starting with that, and the same thing on the subwoofers of getting the extra 10 dB headroom in the subwoofers. So we've got 115 there, making sure the subwoofer is not only in the right place in the room, but also has um, enough uh, low frequency extensions, so make sure the sub is, is, is good enough, frankly, to, to be able to play the soundtracks, and also loud enough. Make sure we've got enough output from the subwoofer to keep up with the speakers. There's no, there's no, there's no point having left centre and right speakers that are highly dynamic and subwoofers that can't play as loud. Then the whole system becomes compromised. So it's looking at the whole thing holistically. If, if we're going to sit here, where should the speakers be? If that's where they're going to be, which ones should they be? If we're using those speakers, which subwoofers are right? Where do they work in the room? All at the same time, looking at the projector screen size, making sure the projector has got the right brightness and the right throw ratio to work. Make sure sight lines are working. Everything holistically, and of course, the, the nature of this is that when you change one thing, you change everything. So um, we're always going backwards and forwards to make sure that the room is working properly. And hopefully, if as you see with with our showroom here and with the, a system that is is set right, you don't notice it's right. You notice when it's wrong. So. It's a, it's a very strange one because I think the better we do our jobs, the less you notice us. I think that um, ultimately a family should be watching a, a film or a sporting event or a big TV program, whatever it happens to be, um, and not thinking about us. They shouldn't be thinking about amps and speakers and projectors. They should be lost in the moment and, and enjoying the movie. And it's one of those things that the, the better the system gets, the weirdly the less you notice it it's a, it's a bit like seeing a seeing a live band play and if they sound amazing you say well done they're an amazing band 
If they sound terrible, you look at the engineer and say, what are they doing? It's that we don't want to be looking at the engineers. We want to be looking at the amazing band. So that, that's kind of, our role is a strange one. If we get all the engineering size right and, and are able to design the room as we, as we want it to be, then actually the clients and their friends and families won't really notice. They'll just notice they're enjoying the film more than they've ever noticed before. Or enjoyed it more than before. And, and uh, I think that's, um, that's quite fun. You know, when we add, add subwoofers and people think, oh, it'll be too much bass. I said, no, it's just better bass. And that's, that's great, you know. So it's a, it's a, it's a strange one that it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't always show itself when it's, when it's right, but I think it's very noticeable when it's wrong. Um, there's, there's a, I mean, there's a few, and I revisit films all the time. Um, I think the one that, my Desert Island film, if there needs to be one, would probably be Blade Runner, um, which is a film that I've gone back to more times than I care to remember. But I do remember, in fact, here one, uh, uh, one evening we had the, we just got the 4K Blu-ray of Blade Runner, the original, although I love the new one, but the original Blade Runner, uh, 4K with its Atmos mix. And I thought, I need to watch that again and I watched that here for the first time on 4k and uh, it was like watching a brand new film again it was absolutely breathtaking and that's that's a film that I think uh, has has stood the test of time continues to inspire both filmmakers and and, and beyond I think it's a, it's a work of art um, no one seems to know and I think that's it's quite interesting I think a home cinema is different things to different people um, to me, I think the cinema is defined by the size of the picture and the size of the sound. Big picture, big sound. And I think even if you've got an incredible picture quality, if the screen is too small, like a tablet, it's never cinematic. The picture might be fantastic quality, but it's not cinematic. I think it's the same with the sound. We can have a, a huge picture, but if the sound doesn't match it, then it's, it feels like big telly. And that's, that's fine. In some rooms, it suits perfectly well. But it's not cinematic, and I think to, to make something feel cinematic, the picture and the sound absolutely need to go together. They need to feel as one, so you don't question one over the other. The size of the image and the, um, the experience of, of what you're seeing on screen should also be matched or contrasted by the sound that you're hearing, so that they, they go together um, as part of the storytelling. And sometimes those two things can be juxtaposed and can tell different stories and sometimes they can marry perfectly that's that's up to the filmmakers but it's it's the the, the picture and the sound together is what makes is what makes cinema i think in terms of whether we talk about a dedicated cinema room or a media room or these other terms that are, are banded around i don't really see much difference between them i think we would always approach each each of any 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 room that is considered to be a primary location for watching films and big event TV is treated with the same respect. So that may well be a, an 85 inch TV, it might be a drop down screen, it might be a dedicated fixed 170 inch screen. It's the same criteria that would follow. I think it's making sure that the room can be as best it can be given the parameters that we need to work with. And maybe a TV is better because of too much ambient light. Maybe a drop down screen is better because it's a, a multi-purpose room. Maybe a fixed screen is better because that's the only reason for being in the room is to watch something. So our job, I think, collectively is to find the right solution for the right room for the right reasons. And that's all part of the consultation. In terms of the way we're designing the systems, I don't think that we should be looking at a media room being any less than a dedicated cinema. I think we can get the same level of performance, we just have to do it in a slightly different way. But that's all part of the design process. I think it's just that our, in our industry is trying to define them, and I don't think it needs to. No. I think there's, there's too much of having to put things in boxes and have categories of yeah. things. And actually, it's, it's, there isn't much difference between them. It's just whether we have... You, know, you can't define a cinema or a media room via whether you've got cinema seats or a sofa. No. It's the same room. It's in your house. It's the same experience. So I, I, we treat them exactly the same. It's just that the, some rooms are better with a bar, some are better with a pool table at the back, some are better with three rows of seats. Yeah. Depends on the room, the application, the clients. The so, it's, all, it's all part of it. The experience should be consistent and the experience yeah. should be uh, done to exactly the same standards, um, use the same, the same rules, the same guidelines, the same um, uh, room mode calculations, the route, same integrity and, and, and effort goes into the same rate. It's, it's no different. It's just the you're having a pool table at the back or not doesn't make it a better cinema or not. Yeah. 
It's just a different application, and that's absolutely fine. Whatever, whatever's right for that, that home and for that family. Yeah, it can. We, we always take a holistic approach in the room, so we're not always, although our day job is the speakers and, and the sound part of it, and of course that's where most of the passion and knowledge is, we are also fully aware of that it's, it's a holistic experience and the room is what, the, the, end, the end experience is what's important. Mm. The picture is just as important part of that, although we have less expertise in it. Mm. But we take a, a very healthy interest in it to make sure that we're at least um, introducing the right people. So it might be that this is you know, beyond our expertise, but you should meet these guys or make sure we're part of the conversation. The screen size needs to be big enough and thankfully the industry tell us the size it needs to be so based again on the seating position and how far back we are we can you know strongly suggest this is the right size screen and and checking throw ratios of of some of the projectors out there projectors have got so good now you know there's so many brands making amazing images um it's a, it's definitely a, a part of the conversation we have it's something that we flag up with with the team to make sure that it's it's considered as you know, an important part of it. It's not the main knowledge we bring to the to the uh, equation, but we certainly help where we can. We certainly don't dismiss it. It's important. Yeah. And, what and, I, and, I, and, I, and actually, on the on on the picture, I do do a basic calibration right. because I understand enough, yeah. but I'm not a video expert. Yeah. So, but. Most people aren't doing enough, <laughs> so you know, add that. The acoustics for a room are, are important. I think that they're, um, they're something that can be dealt with in a number of ways with, with again, with a lot of common sense. I think um, soft furnishings helps, and it's in a, in a room that's got a lot of energy in it, a lot of acoustic energy in it, it's important it's not rattling around. So there's some really obvious things that like we don't want tiled floor and if we do, then we really want a nice big thick rug. So think about the flooring, a carpet makes a lot more sense. Um, some soft um, uh, furnishings, you're gonna have some seating in there. They work brilliantly for, for acoustics. And then look at the walls and maybe look at some, uh, some fabric treatment on the walls. Um, I don't think it's anything that needs to be terrifying or scary. It's just, it's some common sense and some, some conscious thought rather than, um, just ignoring it and, and letting it happen. I think just have a, have, a, have, a, have a conversation about it, work out what's going to work in terms of the aesthetics, the practicalities, and just make sure it's, it's looked at. I think it's also worth mentioning that the amplifiers that are available now have incredible room EQ systems. And although a room EQ can't fix a bad room, um, the combination of having sensible room design in terms of you know, some, some soft furnishings and some um, some some some, something within the room that's going to make sure that we, we, we address the acoustics together with intelligent use of the room EQ, together the combinations are amazing. We, we calibrate a, a large proportion of the rooms that we're involved in helping the installers at the end to make sure that this is measuring right. So it's not just an opinion, we've got a, a nice pink noise curve that we're measuring with a microphone, a curve that we aim at and we can we can work on that until we know that the curve is is right. The, the room is performing exactly as we predicted back at the design stages, so that there's no surprises all the way through. It's not a case of design a room and then good luck everybody. It's seeing it right the way through to the end, making sure that what we end up leaving at the client's home is is exceeding any expectations and is at least as good as we uh, as we promised, um, and seeing it right through there. And I think having the the right combination of sensible room acoustics, a good quality amplifier, the right speakers for the project, thinking about the whole thing together, the seating locations again, uh, subwoofer locations, making sure every part of this is taken into account means that when we finally get to hand the room over and they watch their first film, it's a, it's a, it's a wonder and a thing of joy. We, we have a, um, a very uh, interesting approach here, I think, at Acoustic, because we, we have a very scalable range of speakers. So in terms of our own product, we've got, um, We've got about 40 products within the range, but they're all based on the same building block. So it's almost like we make one speaker and then do 40 variations on it. So as such, the story that we have here is, is one to explain that scalability. So we start off with a small two-channel system just to get the idea of the quality to be expected, which hopefully is, is a good starting point where people understand that we're, we're, we're delivering a level of performance that perhaps they didn't expect but then to take through the range just to show what happens as you go up through the arrays and end up in this cinema where we've got um, you know, no compromises and, and 
the, you know, full blown one of the, the one of our top speakers in here for this this distance. It's the right speaker for the room, um, and it shows the scalability of the whole thing. So really, although the showroom is is clearly has acoustic speakers playing, we're actually selling more the scalability of the range rather than each individual speaker. So we're not saying this speaker is not is better than this speaker. We're saying this is the right speaker for this room, and this is why. And trying to explain that story because once you ex once you understand that then you can see how scalable it is in terms of your own room and, and, and position it so that it's, um, when, we, when we explain the choice of a, a certain speaker model that we think is right for a certain room, we can explain why. And hopefully the story here is filled in those gaps so yeah, I understand that, that makes sense. So it's, a, it's a very much a, a story through the range of scalability of, of the range, which obviously has the Danish aesthetic and um, you know, looks great, sounds great, it's flexible, has all the different uh, bespoke options and colours and all the rest of our story. But that scalability to go from the smallest through to the largest and maintain the same, the same quality. So the story hasn't changed. It's just it's the same story in a different room. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, if that if that story was is right and compelling for this room, then we can transfer transfer it to another room and it's still the right thing so it makes it a lot more predictable there's less surprises it's uh, it means that every room that we go to to help calibrate i know how it's going to sound because it should sound like this the show we worked on with indigo zest has worked on exactly the same principles that we did the one here so um by designing the space based on the room itself first and then looking at the correct parameters in terms of the seating position the wish to have a bar at the back which i think aesthetically is fantastic that gave us a definition of the, the, the seating position from there we could then work out the speaker locations we then from that could work out exactly which of our models were the right ones for that room also helping with the screen size and making sure the projector was right and again the same holistic approach but it, it means that we've got a room at, at, at the indigo zest showroom which is is built on exactly the same building blocks and the same designs that we've built our own showroom here and we build every showroom on again it's predictable so if, uh, if we go along to your showroom and experience it and have a, a, a fantastic um, experience of, 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 of audio and, 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 sound, uh, and, and picture and it's you know, a fantastically cinematic experience, if we design another room to the same criteria, we'll end up with a very, very similar experience. And I think that, that scalability, that, pro that, that um, predictability and that, um, uh, that approach to, to designing the right, r right system for the room is something that I think is, is, is fairly unusual, but it's the right way of doing it. And then a customer can walk into that space and know the exact experience they're going to get. Yes, yeah, if, if, we, if we experience the system designed to the right criteria and then we design another room to the same criteria, we get a very, very similar experience. So it's a lot more predictable. It's, um, it's something that, that isn't about necessarily um, an individual component within that cinema space. It's the fact the whole thing has been designed for the room holistically and collaboratively. So there's a, there's a team working to make sure that the aesthetics work with the audio, works with the picture, works with the controls. Everything's working together seamlessly. And because it's designed for that space, with a different space, the maths changes, the products may change within it, but the result's the same.